And everybody said, I welcome everyone to our workers' training tonight in Jesus' name. And I pray that the training will bear fruit in every life. In my heart, in your heart. And God will give us the reward of faithful ministry in Jesus' name. Father, we do thank you and bless your name for keeping us alive, keeping us healthy, and keeping us focused, granting us the vision, giving us the vision that we will serve you acceptably in our generation in Jesus' name. As we come to the teaching training session tonight, we pray, Lord, you speak to every heart in Jesus' name. Be glorified in our lives and let this work prosper in every hand in Jesus name thank you Lord for the answer in Jesus name we pray tonight we are coming to Luke chapter 9 we are reading and studying from verse 57 Luke chapter 9 verse 57 and it came to pass that as they went in the way a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. In verse 58, And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nets, but the Son of Man has not where to lay his head. In verse 59, and he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Verse 60, and Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Verse 61, and another man also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. Then in verse 62, and Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, a speech for the kingdom of God. Here we find Jesus, our Lord and Master. We find Jesus, our Lord and Savior. We find Jesus, our Redeemer. And the one that leads the way and shows us the way that he confronted the people that said they wanted to follow him. If you look at verse 57, you'll find that word, follow. And you look at verse 15, 59, you'll find the word, follow. And then in verse 61, we still have the word, follow. They wanted to follow. I will follow. He called one of them, follow me. And the other one, follow me. And there was no doubt if they were to go by their own terms, if they were to set the condition, they would like to follow. Follow at my own pace. Follow at my own time. Follow in my own way. Follow with my own terms. Follow with my own conditions. But the point is, Christ will not allow anyone wanting to follow him, a sinner wanting to follow him. He will not allow that sinner to dictate or to, to determine the terms and the condition of following. And he will not allow anyone, even a believer, even a saved soul, who wants to keep on following, to follow at their own terms, in their own condition. He will not allow ministers, he will not allow members, he will not allow any servant, he will not allow any soul winner to follow at their own pace, in their own way, the way they want. He wanted them to understand, yes, he wanted them to follow, he wanted them to understand that he will set the condition. 
he will set the terms of following a time like it was at that time it is still the same today he will not allow you to set the terms lord i will follow you lord i'll do as you have said lord i want to get to heaven lord i want to follow the way that leads to heaven he will not allow you to map out the way the broad way the personal way the convenient way the comfortable way he will not allow you to set that and say i will follow but this is the way i will follow neither will he allow a preacher a pastor a shepherd an overseer anyone to set the condition i've been following now for all these many years as at now in this new age in this new dispensation i'm going to follow in this way no he still has the final word and he sets the pace and he shows the way and he says you're following this is the way to follow and so we're looking at the message tonight following christ on his own terms to heaven for every pilgrim who wants to get to heaven for every soldier who wants to make it to the end of the journey and he wants to serve the Lord acceptably for you for me for us here or there anywhere following Christ on his own terms to heaven he sets the standard he shows the way and he tells us this is the way walk ye therein and the message again tonight is following christ i've decided to follow christ no turning back no turning back the world behind me the cross before me no turning back no turning back i've decided to follow jesus the friends suppose me yet i will follow i've decided to follow jesus all the things of the past i put in the past and now with a single mind with a purposeful heart and with a set gaze i'm following the lord on his own terms and there's no other way we're going the final destination the final place is that we get to heaven following christ on his own terms to heaven three things we're looking at number one we're looking at decision to follow christ without counting the cause he wants us to count the cause but the first man that came he didn't think of the cost where would where is he living and where shall i live with him and in what way at what speed is he going what's his commitment to do everything the father had told him to do the man did not count the cause and he wanted to follow there are people that take decisions and they never count the cause he says decision to follow christ without counting the cause number two devotion in following christ with consistency in consecration that whatever it will demand whatever consecration or commitment this will demand it will not be comfortable it will not be something i thought of before i wasn't thinking of that 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 will be part of following the lord yet so consistent if we're going to follow the lord there might be persecution there might be demand to do what we are not used to doing there may be demand to even endure what we are not used to enduring but at the same time if that is the way and if that is the calling we're following christ for devotion and with consistency in consecration number three diligence in fulfilling his commission he wants us to preach the gospel he wants us to lay our hands on the plow and never looking back there might be some obstacles in the way that obstacle will be the way we will not avoid will not evade will not go as i will not be distracted that obstacle will be the way we'll go through 
that obstacle and still keep on following. Others have done it before us. Others have gone the same way before us and we're still going to follow that way. Diligence in fulfilling his commission with compelling concentration. One thing I do. He goes through the prison one thing I do. He goes through challenges and he says, one thing I do. He's supposed, he's persecuted, he's hindered, he's pushed here and there. He says, no matter what, one thing I do. Diligence in fulfilling his commission with compelling consecration we're looking at number one number one is decision to follow christ and then he says without counting because in luke chapter 9 verse 57 and it came to pass that after they went in the way a certain man nameless man a certain man said unto him lord i will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. The Lord knew his heart. And so the Lord said in verse 58, in verse 58, and Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, and the Son of Man has nowhere, not where to lay his head. He says, young man, you want to follow me? Where we're we going to sleep tonight. You want to follow me? What meal are we going to have today if you start following me? You want to follow me? How are we going to pay for that and for that? You want to follow me? Foxes, of course. And the birds are there, they are nests, but I have nowhere to lay my head. I don't even have as much as those uh, birds you see, as those foxes you see. And the man dropped out, we can't hear of him anymore. And he has no record in the book of life because he had not counted the cause. We're looking at three things here. Number one, number one is declaration and cost of following the Lord. He declared it, but wasn't able to pay the price. And then number two is the demonstration of consecration in following the Lord. We must demonstrate that we want to back up our word, our declaration, our decision by the commitment of our lives. Number three is the demand for comprehension in following the Lord. The Lord was demanding from him do you understand? Can you comprehend? Do you know what you are saying? He demanded that we should have comprehension, understanding of what we are declaring of the decision that we are taking. Look at number one. Number one is the declaration and cost of following the Lord. In Numbers chapter 14, reading from verse 24. Numbers 14 verse 24. But my servant Caleb, that the Almighty God saying, Caleb is my servant. Moses, like you are my servant. Caleb too is my servant. My servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him. Another spirit from the millions of the Israelites. He distinguished himself. He separated himself. And he showed that was a different mind, a different perspective, a different understanding, a different comprehension in you. To follow the Lord, it must be in the terms of the Lord. And he says, my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit within him and had followed me fully had followed me fully. Him will I bring into the land wherein, whereunto he went, and his seed shall possess it. He didn't see any other thing that others have not seen, but he knew there is a great God in heaven, a big God in heaven, and he has taken us to the land of promise. And he said he would have made all the arrangements and everything. And even though the other people said, well, like grasshoppers in the sight of the people, and they said they cannot go in, they cannot follow. He said, let us go in at once. There will be bread for us. And if the Lord be with us and he is with us, we shall surely take the land. 
woman, he had a mind of faith, a heart of faith, a disposition of faith. He was looking at the invisible God in heaven and he said, we will be there. And thank God he was there and I will be there. You'll be there in Jesus' name. You see, but to follow the Lord, you count the cost. We're going to meet those giants. No matter how tall they are, we're going to meet those uh, people in their walls, in their thick walls and high walls. We're going to meet them. We're going to fight, a fight of faith, and we're going to win. We're going to overcome. You must count the cost. We're not just going in a sea, no Jericho walls, or just fall down. There is something to do. We're ready to do it. There is a river a children to cross and we're going to cross that we're going to do that in the power of the Lord count the cost the Canaanites are there count the cost the walls of Jericho are there count the cost the river overflowing river of Jordan is there count the cost and then the Lord is going to break down every barrier but you must be willing you must know that those challenges are there so that it is not when a challenge appears then you'll be wavering and you'll be saying where do we go where do we go count the cost and we will go in in Jesus name in Ruth chapter 1 I'm reading from verse 12 Ruth chapter 1 verse 12 turn again my daughters Naomi was now saying to Opa and to Ruth go your way for I am too old eh, to have an husband if I should say I have hope I should and I should if I should have an husband also tonight and should also bear sons. All those things are probabilities. Can I have a husband? Look at how old I am. Can I get pregnant again? Look at how old I am. And can I bear children? Look at me now. Even if I'll bear children, am I sure that they will be sons and not daughters? Even all those probabilities are to work possibly on my side. Are you going to wait? Look at verse 13. In verse 13, it tells us, would you tarry? Would you wait for them till they were grown and become marriageable? Will you stay for them from having husbands? Count the cost. Are, are you sure that if you follow me to my land of nativity, are you sure that if you follow me to the land of Israel, I would have any, any son? What if I do? Are you going to wait all that long before you get married? Marriage is very important. Raising your family is very important. Would you wait? Count the cost. There are people today, they want to follow the Lord. They're too much in a hurry. I will follow. I will follow. I'm going to follow the Lord. And they are not counting the cost. They are not married yet. Are you going to obey the Lord? Are you going to wait for the choice of God? Are you going to do exactly the will of God and not to be pushed and pulled and drawn and driven by your flesh, by the drive within you? The Lord is saying, yes, follow me, but count the cause. Some people want to be ministers. Are you going to be able to forsake everything you have been pursuing before? Are you going to be able to drop everything in your life that might weigh you down? Count the cause. And here Ruth also counts the cause. It says, Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is, one, is gone out against me. And then he tells us in verse 14, in verse 14, and they lifted up their voice and wept again. It is counting the cause we are talking about. It's more than emotion emotion sometimes you know you listen to a stunning message and emotionally i will follow i will follow without counting the cost sometimes you listen to an appeal and the appeal says people are dying souls are dying we need evangelists we need soul winners you can do it i can do it we can do it emotionally we say i volunteer i surrender count the cost. We say we're winning sinners to the Lord and we're going to all the regions beyond and everywhere and no matter what is on the way, a lion on the way, we are going to follow. Count 
the cause. Other people have done it and other people are running and they are running well and they are running so fast. If he could do it, I can do it. If she can do it, I can do it to count the cause. That's what happened here. And it says they lifted up their voice and wept again and upper kissed a mother-in-law and said goodbye. That's too much for me. I'm counting and look at how old I am. And then you're saying, I wish you were going to get a husband. If we follow you, bye-bye. I'll not see you again. She counted the cause, but then she went away. She said, I cannot. At least she didn't deceive herself. She didn't say, I am following and grudgingly following. At least she didn't say, all right, I'm coming and complaining while she was following. And then grumbling and murmuring, is it, is going to be, is this how it's going to be? She counted the cause and she said, she could not make it with Naomi. And she said, not counting on the grace of God, she could not make it to heaven. She fell off. But then Ruth clave unto her. In verse 15, in verse 15 it says, And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. Loneliness is a great, great problem. For many years, the only uh, person that uh, Ruth knew as a very close, intimate, familiar companion was Opa. The, the husbands are dead. They had Naomi and they had themselves to relate with. They were younger people. They couldn't relate with Naomi the way they relate with each other. And it's going to be real vacancy created for Ruth because of her, the closest uh, age mate or maybe uh, whatever, is now gone. Gone back to her people. Gone back to her idols. And Ruth will feel the absence and the loneliness. Can you face that loneliness? Somebody you have been very familiar with in the Christian life, in the Christian commitment, in the church, or in the ministry, or in the service of the Lord, he decides that he cannot pay the price. He cannot count the cause. He's forsaking Jesus. He's forsaking the service of the Lord. And he said, not only privately, openly, I'm gone. And he's gone. You are familiar, you are intimate. Now, you don't have anybody to discuss with or to rub your minds with. She's gone. He is gone. You feel lonely. Can you accommodate that loneliness with your calling? Can you accommodate that loneliness with your decision that you're going to follow? That's what Ruth did. And it says, return thou after thy sister-in-law. And then in verse 16, here we find the real decision that has counted the cause. And Ruth said, entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee, for with that thou goest, I will go. And with that, thou lodgest our lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. In verse 17, she says, Where thou diest, will I die? It's saying, You are much older than I am. You are my mother in law. In all probability, you will die before me and leave me behind. But you know, after you have died, after you are dead, I'll still keep to my vow. I'll keep to my commitment. When you die, after you've gone, I'll stay there. The people that you leave behind might be friendly, they might be hostile, whatever they, whatever they do, and however they are, I have counted the cost. Have you counted the cost? The person you came with when you came to Christ, maybe he's no more here. Have you counted the cost? When you started the work, the work of the Lord, this was the person who relate with very well. 
she's no more there he's no more there have you counted the cause the people that you to counsel you doing this way go this way go that way the fellow said that this way of holiness is too high for him for her the slope is too steep for him or for her and he said bye bye and he's gone have you counted the cost that no matter what others do however they stay or they run away you have so counted the cost that you abide when thou diest will i die and he says there will i be buried the lord do so to me and more also if aught but death part thee and uh, me we're looking at second samuel chapter 15 verse 15 in second samuel chapter 15 verse 15 and the king's servant said unto the king behold thy servants are ready to do whatsoever my lord the king shall appoint and then in verse 17 verse 17 says and the king went forth he was going because absalom was behind wanting to run after him and get at him and dispose of him so he had to run he had to go with that the lord will direct him and the king went forth and all the people after him and tarried in a place that was far off and then in verse 18 in verse 18 and all his servant passed on beside him and all the chitterites uh, church, and all the pelitites and all the gittites 600 men much uh, which came after him from God passed on before the king look at verse 19 in verse 19 then the king said unto Etai the Gittite whither wherefore goest thou also with us it says wherefore are you coming up are you following after us return to thy place and abide with the king abide with the person who has now raised himself up to be the king to be the leader the lord has not anointed him the lord has not prepared him the lord has not raised him but he raised up himself as the king and he has deposed me and i'm going I know where I'm going. He says, Return unto the place and abide with the king, for thou art a stranger. You have just come, and also an exile. Then in verse 20, in verse 20, whereas thou camest but yesterday, should I this day make thee go up and down with us? Uh, seen, I go whither I may return, return thou and take back thy brethren, mercy and truth be with thee. You know, if it's another person who has not counted the cost, who didn't really want to fully follow, he'll say, David has prayed for me. And he has said, I can't go back. I don't have to make this sacrifice. I don't have to make this trip. I don't have to follow him. And he has even prayed for me. But look at the next verse in verse 21. In verse 21, it tells us, And Etai answered the king and said, As the Lord liveth, and as my Lord capital L as God lays, small L, David, the Lord, his Lord, as my Lord, the King live, surely in what place my Lord, the King, shall be with her in death or life, even there also will thy servant be. That's commitment. That's wanting to follow and counting the cause. Whatever wind may blow, whatever circumstance may raise up its ugly head, whatever may be the persecution, the situation, whether in death or in life, wherever my Lord the King, 
We don't know the future. Maybe that man Absalom will succeed. Maybe he'll put you down permanently. Whatever and wherever I, eat, I have decided I'm going to follow. That is counting the cause as we are following the Lord. But the people who are limping, the people who are wobbling, and the people who are not so steady, they are unsteady. They are dependable. They are still watching on the face. If things go my way, if what I'm expecting comes, if what I envisage will happen, maybe then I'll quickly join. But if not, then I'll know how to find my way. Those are not people who are dependable. Look at verse 22. In verse 22, he tells us, and David said unto Itai, go pass over. And Itai, the Gittite, passed over. And all his men, he didn't leave anything behind. And all the little ones that were seen. That is declaring our decision to follow Christ and then backing it up with the consecration, backing it up with the counting of the cause so that we follow appropriately. We're looking at number two. Number two is the demonstration of concentration, of consecration in following the Lord. There must be a way to demonstrate either by word of mouth, either by body language, either by action, either by the things we do, the things we forsake, the old bridge we burn up. That he is here, we're crossing the bridge so as to follow the Lord, and immediately after crossing the bridge, we we'll look back and we we'll dispose of that bridge so that there's no bridge to take us back, and we're really determined in demonstration that we're going to follow the Lord. The demonstration of consecration in following the Lord. We're looking at First Kings chapter 19, verse 16. Chapter 19, verse 16. And Jehu, the son of Nephshai, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, God gave the name of Elisha to Elijah. We don't know whether Elisha had any wind of age, whether he knew that God was going to call him by Elijah. There was no mention of that. There are people that will say, I didn't hear of that before. I didn't know that. See me, Elijah, I'm at work and I'm plowing with the yoke of oxen. And if God would want me to leave all these 12 yoke of oxen, he would have spoken to me, but he said nothing to me. And you just came now, and you put your mantle on me. He told Elijah, and he had not told Elisha, but the call came through Elijah. And you can see this man, when the call came on him, he demonstrated consecration to follow the Lord. We're looking at, uh, verse, uh, at the latter part of that verse 16. It says, verse 16, please, in verse 16, and Elisha, the son of Shepheth, of Abel Mehola, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room, in thy room, in thy place, in thy stead, you'll anoint Elisha. We're looking at verse 19, in verse 19, so he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shepherd who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him and he was with the twelve and Elijah passed by him and he cast his mantle upon him he didn't say Elijah good afternoon the Lord spoke to me you believe me and the Lord said very clearly, I mentioned your name, and that you are to be the prophet that will come to help, to prophesy, to preach, to encourage, to inspire the children of Israel after me. 
No, nothing like that. He didn't tell him anything. He just threw his mantle upon him. Look at verse 20. In verse 20, it tells us, and he left the oxen. There are people that will not understand until you explain and explain and explain over and over again. But Elisha, he understood. Not a word from Elijah. Just the mantle on him. And he understood. He understood. There are people that will not understand the blinking of an eye. You are talking to them and you make the facial expression to send a message. They don't understand. There are people you lay hands on them and you grab them by the shoulder. They won't understand. There are people, you throw the paper to them, and there's something written on that paper, they don't understand. But Elisha, when Elijah threw the mantle on him, he understood immediately. You know, when we're ready to follow the Lord with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, when we are prepared and we say, Lord, I will pay the price. I count the cost. Whatever it is, here is what I'm going to do. They know, they understand the slightest declaration in the slightest way. They can understand because they are ready to follow the Lord. And then he left his oxen and he ran after Elijah and said, let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother. Here is not to say, it's not to seek approval. It's not to seek permission. It's not to say a new call came upon me. Shall I? Shall I not? May I? May I not? No. He just wanted because I went out in the morning out of the house and then if I don't come back and tell them they were wondering what happened to me so let me just inform me then I am gone and then I will follow thee and he said unto him go back again for what have I done to thee? Look at verse 21. And in verse 21, we're told, and he returned back unto him. He went to say bye-bye to the father, bye-bye to the mother. When you reach daddy and mommy, it depends on how you tell them. It depends on what you tell them. If you say, daddy, there's a man, he just came to me on the field and he threw the mantle on me and I'm thinking maybe I should follow him. If daddy says, what do you mean? Anybody can throw a mantle on anybody. Do you know Elijah? Do you know that man is an hard man, a coarse man? Have you seen his method? Do you know his way? You want to follow him? It depends on how you tell your family you want to follow the Lord. If you tell them with conviction, if you tell them with mind made up, if you tell them this is the future, in the farm, in the field, there's no future there, and I'm going to follow the Lord come what me when you see that you are determined when you when they see that your face is set when they see that there's no other way this is the only way they'll have no choice to release you and even if they didn't release you you are not asking for them for permission to release you you are telling them I'm gone this is the way bye bye and it is bye bye and we're told he returned back from him and he took, took a yoke of oxen and he slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen and gave unto the people, friends and neighbors and everybody, and they did eat. Then he arose. There wasn't any rope or chain tying him down. There are people that are tied down by an invisible chain, invisible rope. They so much attached to this friend. They're so much attached to this man. They're so much attached to this woman. They're so much attached to these people. And because they are tied down, they can never rise up and follow the Lord. This man had made up his mind and he knew this is the way he was going to follow. They did and then he arose and he went after Elijah and ministered unto Elijah. Ministered unto Elijah. How? What was he doing? Was he reading scriptures to him? No. 
Was he interpreting scriptures to him? No. Was he encouraging him in his low moments? No. He was just taking a bowl of water and pouring water on his hand. A businessman, a successful businessman, a director of his own work that was, you see, 12 yoke of oxen. He left everything and come and look at Elijah. He ministered unto Elijah, just pouring water on his hand. What a ministry, what a calling. He says, don't worry about that. The Lord will make me do the final effective ministry. You see the point? These people counted the cause. And in counting the cause, they didn't minimize the ministry. The Lord was calling them to, we're looking at number three here. Number three, we're looking at the demand for comprehension in following the Lord. We're looking at Luke chapter 9 and we're looking at verse 57. It says, and it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus didn't say, wonderful, come in. There's room for you. There's room for another one. No, he wanted him to, him to understand, to comprehend the meaning of what he was saying. He wants us to understand the vows we're making, the consecration we're declaring. He wants us to understand all those things. Where I laid this on the altar. I laid that on the altar. I said, don't be emotional. Don't be emotional. Understand what you are saying, the comprehension of what we say when we decide we're following the Lord. Look at John chapter 6, and I'm reading from verse 2. In John chapter 6, verse 2, and a great multitude followed him because, because, because they saw his miracles which he did on them that were sick that were diseased. Look at verse 24. In verse 24, it says, When the people therefore saw Jesus, saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and they came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. And then in verse 25, in verse 25, and when they had found him, on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, Master, Teacher, Lord, when camest thou thither? And then in verse 26, in verse 26, and Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me. Not because he saw the miracles, but because he did each of the loaves and were filled. He exposed them. And if the Spirit of God could expose you to yourself, why you are following? For what reason you come? For what purpose you are there? If the Spirit of the Lord could expose you to yourself and say, look at this purpose. Look at this goal. Look at this reason. Is it worthy of heaven? Is it worthy of heaven's commendation? What you do? What you say you are following, what you say you are committed, you are consecrated in following God, in following the Lord, is this worthy of commendation from heaven? And so the Lord said, can I tell you why you are taking so much effort and you are running after me and you say you are following me? Not because you see those miracles and then you say if anyone can do this, it's worth your followership. It's because your edge of those loaves on your field. Look at verse 27. In verse 27, labor not for the meat which perishes. Don't just stay there and say you are following me because of the material things you're able to get from me. 
Don't say you are following me because you are doing like the people of the world. Even the people that are not saved, that are not born again, they too, they will run after me if they are sure that I'll be giving them meals every day miraculously. Don't do that. He says, labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you for him as the Father, as the God the Father appointed. I pray we'll follow with all our heart, with all our soul, and all our mind in Jesus' name. Now coming to point number two. Point number two, devotion in following Christ with consistency in consecration. Underline that on your outline, your writing. Number one is the consecration. Consecration. As you look at your life, have you consecrated anything? Something precious to you. Something you could, you could have made use of so to be at par with your colleagues in the world. Something you could have been enjoying, like other people are enjoying. And this is just, and it is legitimate. Have you ever surrendered anything to the Lord which could have been useful to you? Then you'll not touch it. It is for the Lord. The second question is, have you been consistent in consecration? I'm looking back now, and I'm thinking about when I became born again, 1964, and I had the message direct from the source. And I said, I laid this down. And I look back to 1964. And by the grace of God, there is consistency. There is nothing I've laid down. And I said, why did you lay that down? That's too much for God. That's too much for preaching. That's too much for pastoral ministry. Come on, take it back. There's nothing I laid down at that time that I felt, that I feel now. That's too much. But... I keep on laying more and laying more. And whatever the Lord still demands, I lay that down. There must be consistency in what we lay down for the Lord. Not that we lay it down and then we pick it up and we say, that's too much for ministry. That's too much for the people. That's too much for the salvation of souls. Consistency in consecration and the devotion. The devotion, the devotion that your heart, your mind, your life, everything your hand, you lay everything down and you're saying, oh Lord, is there anything I'm still having that I'm not laying down? Anything I cannot do without anything? I'm saying, I need that now. Oh Lord, indulge me a little. Oh Lord, permit me a little. Look at my age now. Permit me, indulge me and let me keep that. That's no devotion. But when you're devoted to the Lord and you say you're worth more than this and I give everything and I'm going to keep on following you consistently consecrating everything to you uh, that is the devotion in following Christ with consistency in consecration in um, Luke chapter 9 verse 59 and he said unto another follow me and he, but he said Lord suffer me first allow me first permit me first to go and bury my father and then in verse 60, it, Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Other people might say, Suffer me, permit me first to go and get married. But I need to go and get married in another place, not here. Here they don't have, they, they don't have allowance for enough merriment, enough pleasure, enough dancing, enough uh, worldliness. But I will follow you. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. But I need to go and get married first in a, in a place they permit everything. In a place I can let go and, you know, do whatever I want. 
that's not consecration. If you, if you come back, God knows your heart. You wanted to go and do this and do this and do that. Um, some of you are old in the ministry. You remember? You remember that, you know, at first when I started preaching in 1973 at the Bible study, it was like this man is never going to marry. But, you know, don't worry about that. Eventually, the Lord led me to marry. And on the, that day I married, you remember if you were there at that time, immediately we finished. It was Saturday. And then we we're going to what to do follow up what to, because we had done uh, you know crusade at the Tafa Balua School, I think. And we still went for that follow up, and I still preached there as if nothing had happened in the marriage ceremony. Everything still went on, and I didn't excuse myself uh, for Monday Bible study and for this, you know, church or Bible study fellowship at that time. Understand, I just got married, and look at my age. Let me enjoy what has just come. No, everything we give to the Lord. Can you be that consistent? Can you give everything to the Lord? And can you say here, I follow the Lord without looking back as it was. So it is today. There's no letting down. There is no watering down. And there's no diluting of our consecration unto the Lord. But this man said, let me first go and bury my father and do my marriage and do whatever. Then I will come back. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. That was the priority in the mind of Christ and the heart of Christ. Go preach the kingdom of God. We're looking at three things here. Number one, follow Christ and let the dead bury their dead. Number two, focus on Christ and be dead to the dead need. There are things that come into our lives and they deaden our lives. They deafen our ears and they clamp us down and we cannot really fly and move on like we need to move on. It says focus on Christ and be dead to the deadening things of life. Number three, fish for Christ. Declare deliverance for the dead. Number one, we're looking at follow, following Christ and letting the dead bury their dead. What does that mean? The dead bury their dead. We're looking at 1 Timothy chapter 5, and we're reading from verse 6. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 6, But she that liveth in pleasures is dead. She that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. Now, the father had died physically. There are people that are living in worldliness, in pleasure, in earthly comfort, earthly entertainment. They are dead spiritually. Let the spiritually dead who do not have the life of Christ, they do not have passion in their soul, they do not have any calling for the kingdom of God, they do not have any lively spirit that will make them do what the Lord is calling them to do. Let those purposeless people, let those spiritless people, let those worldly people, let those superficial people go bury their dead relatives but you don't spend all your life and don't spend your time don't spend the precious commodity the lord has given you burying the dead the dead spiritually dead they can do that good enough don't join them in revelation chapter 3 verse 1 revelation chapter 3 we're looking at verse 1 and unto the angel unto the minister the pastor of the church is that is right these things say he that has the seven spirits of God and the seven and the seven stars, I know thy works that thou hast a name that thou livest, but art dead. You live physically, you live religiously, you live in 
religious rituals, but you are dead. Those are the people. Let those dead people, they don't hear the voice of God, they're spiritually dead. They don't see the vision of God, they're spiritually dead. They don't have the passion for eternity, they're spiritually dead. All right, let's do dead, dead, dead people. Let them go bury their dead. Not your dead. It's not your dead. The dead doesn't belong to you anymore. You have a life and you have a calling and you have a focus. Let the dead bury their dead. We're looking at number two here. Number two here is to focus on Christ and be dead to the dead need. And be dead to the dead need. There are things that come into our lives and they can deaden us. They can blindfold us. They can remove our energy. They can sap our energy. They can make us dead. That even to carry ourselves will become so difficult. Their influence has deadened us. Their interaction, they have a way of killing our prayer lives. And the things they discuss with us, they have the tendency of just making us as dead as the dead sinners in the world. That we cannot carry any burden, we don't have any fire, we don't have any light. The people, their influence have so impressed on us, imposed themselves on us, they dead in us. Now, be dead to them and make sure that you are not part of them so that you can keep the life alive and you can keep the fire alive and you can keep the passion alive it says focus on christ and be dead to the dead need well you came in at colossians chapter 3 verse 1 in colossians chapter 3 verse 1 if he then be risen with christ you used to be dead, but now you are risen up with Christ. You used to be kind of dull, like a, like a log of wood. You are just there. You didn't sense the sense of the time. And the, and the things happening at the time, that day is the moment to rise up and go preach the gospel. You used to be dead, but now you are born again. You are risen. You have spiritual resurrection. If you then be dead, we will be risen with Christ. Seek those things which are above, where Christ seated on the right hand of God. And then in verse 3 it says, you set your affections on the things above. Focus on Christ. Focus on Christ. There are discussions that can deaden our prayer life. There are pursuits that can deaden our spiritual pursuit. And there are things that can deaden our lively vision. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. In verse, uh, verse 3, it says, For ye are dead, you are dead to the things of the world that deaden us. For ye are dead, and your life is seen with Christ in God. And then in verse 4, it says, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Somebody shout, Amen. Look at Romans chapter 6, verse 7. In Romans chapter 6, we're looking at verse 7. For he that is dead is freed from sin. He that is dead. Now you are dead to the world. You are dead to what is the most important thing in the minds of the people in the world. You know, that's... There are families where the husband can keep enmity with the wife on the basis of politics. Because politics is the heart of the man, is the life of the man, is the thing, is the in thing for the man. And you know, he was uh, saying, this person will win. And the wife just innocently just said, I don't think so. I think this is the other man that will win final. 
Because the man, that is his life. What, why do you say that? How could you say that? I said that one more way. And then uh, there's energy. Because the man is not dead to the politics of the world. There are people that can cut out their churches because the pastor is preaching. And I said, I think this person is the one that will win. And 80% of the congregation said, what? That's who you want to win? They are gone. They scatter the church because they are not dead to politics. Let you whoever will be there, be there. God is on the throne and God will choose the best for our country in Jesus' name. And so we are not fighting. Be dead to all those things in the world. Are you going to die because of this comment and that comment and that comment? You see, if we're real Christians and we know that God has placed us here on earth to do his work, whether the people are on this camp or in that camp, God has raised us up to preach the gospel to every creature. And you are not going to die or scatter your family or scatter your church because of politics in Jesus' name. He says, for ye are dead. He, and he that is dead is free from sin. All those things of the world, the sin, the sinners, the strategy, the scheming, everything that comes upon the people and they are dead to the things of the world and they are dead to the things of the Lord, they will not dead in your life in Jesus' name. Because we need to focus, focus on Christ. Christ and Christ alone football games you know sometimes when football is going on and the people are watching you cannot get their attention want to go for evangelism they glued to the telly and the game has arrested them they are not dead to the games of the world and when things are happening and it is you know many many things in the world if you're going to really be alive to the calling of the lord you are dead to them dead to sin and dead to all the consequences of sin the lord fulfill that in our lives lives in my life in your life may we remain dead unto them in jesus name we're looking at number three here number three fish for christ and declare deliverance for the dead that's what we are called for we're not called to you know spend all our resources and even go borrow money in the bank when there was, uh, you know, chance to borrow money uh, to, because of burial. And because we want to bury this and bury this. And we, sometimes they, they leave the, uh, the dead body in the morgue, mortuary. And then they are waiting uh, three months, six months. It's still there. And they are paying money every day, every day, every day because of the dead body they put there and you ask them when are you going to do the barrier was well, still contacting the people overseas over there over there and here and we're not ready yet we want to gather millions because it's going to be real burial that didn't take place at the time of Christ. That did not take place at the time of the apostles. Why? Are we so concentrated now on the dead, burying the dead? And then we cannot really preach the gospel and we don't focus on the gospel. Looks like the world is taking many people in the church away back to the world. It's telling us to fish for Christ. That the most important thing in our lives, fish for fish for Christ and declare deliverance for the dead is telling us in uh, Matthew chapter 4 reading from verse 16 it says the people which sat in darkness saw a great light and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death as light light is sprung up then in verse 17 in verse 17 from that time jesus began to preach and to say repent for the kingdom of heaven is at 
hand. And then in verse 18, it tells us in verse 18, and Jesus walking by the sea of Galilee saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. Then in verse 19, it says, and he says unto them, follow me and i will make you fishers of men the lord was saying here is what is to occupy your heart here is what is going to possess all your attention here is your concentration consecration here is your contribution to the kingdom of god here is the thing you are to do from now till the end of your life and there's no other thing you're looking at because now follow me follow me i want you to follow me here is so Literary single thing you have to follow on and you have to focus on until the end of life and I will make you fishers of men and then we're told in verse 20 in verse 20 it says that the straight way no dilly darling I need another message to nail it, you know, to the real point. And there was no delay, and there was no kind of discussion, and there was no argument about it. Follow me, and the straight way led their net, and they followed him. What were they to do now? To fish for Christ, and to go declare deliverance for those who are dead in their sins and in their trespasses. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 2, and we're reading from verse 14. Hebrews chapter 2, we're reading from verse 14, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that he that through death, the death of the cross of Calvary, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. And then in verse 15 it says, and that and delivered them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. He wanted the disciples to go and declare that Christ has died. We know he has died now. We're on this side of the cross. He has died so that he will deliver all the people that are held in bondage by the devil and bring them out of the hand of the devil to become the children of God. Out of darkness to bring them to the light and out of all the things that bog them down, chain them down to release them so that they can serve the Lord. That's what we're to focus on now, fishing for Christ, declaring deliverance for the death. In Ephesians chapter 5, we're reading from verse 14. Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 14, wherefore, where, wherefore he saith, awake, thou that sleepeth, and arise from the dead. He's talking to sinners. He's talking to those who are dead in their sins. He's talking to those who have not known Christ. He's talking to those who need to hear the voice of the Lord and wake up from the dead society and then turn to the Lord so that they can be saved. And he clears, he declares the word in a clear way with a high sound, with a penetrating sound into their heart saying, Awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead and Christ shall give give thee light we're coming to point number three point number three we're looking at the diligence of fulfilling his commission with compelling concentration compelling concentration nobody no other thing arrests your mind detracts your attention sways you here or Swiss you there, but all your mind, all your heart is concentrated on the harvest of souls that Christ came for, and that Christ was raising his disciples and apostles for. And you are diligent about it, you are concentrating on it, you are, you are putting all your strength and all your effort into a diligence in fulfilling his commission with compelling consecration. In Luke chapter 9, reading from verse 61, and another say, also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but, but, but. Lord, understand me, I'm planning. Understand me, I'm walking. Understand me, 
and prepare it. As for following, I will follow thee. But let me first. I have something very important. Let me first. I have something on my mind. Let me first. Whenever we put ourselves first before the commission, and before the calling of God and before the assignment Christ has and before heaven we put something first before going the direction of heaven and that thing is uppermost in our heart and when we hear of rapture we say please please don't mention that again let me accomplish this before the rapture takes place whenever we mention the second coming of Christ he is coming please please don't mention that let me do this first before the rapture when whenever we mention we need to spend money and spend our lives and spend our resources on this evangelism going into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved he that believeth Let's not shall be done. Please, please uh, shed that, shield that, take that away. Let me finish this first. We disqualify ourselves from following the Lord. Anything first that will bring out me first, my agenda first, what I like first, the supreme thing in my heart first, the great thing in my heart first, this one I've been praying, I must achieve this before I die, and so don't mention any other thing now, this is first, we're disqualified from the kingdom of God, another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me First, go bid them farewell, which are at home, at my house. And then in verse 62, in verse 62, Jesus said unto him, No man, any man that does that, that puts anything first, enjoyment first, entertainment first, the flesh first, food first, wine first, world first, games first, Olympic first, whatever, politics first, anyone that puts anything first before answering the call of God disqualifies himself from the kingdom of God. Jesus said unto him, no man having put his sign to the plow and looking back his feet for the kingdom of God. Third things we're looking at here. Number one, the danger of looking back by putting self first. Number two, is the damnation for turning back, seeking satisfaction first. Number three, our destiny for always putting his service first. Look at number one there. Number one is the danger of looking back by putting self first. We're looking at Second Peter chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 20. In Second Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 20, for if after we have escaped the pollutions of the world, through law, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they again entangled therein and overcome. They again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning after we come to know the Lord and we ran after him a little bit and we served him a little bit then we got in contact with the people of the world with some politics of the world with some practices of the world and with some principles of the world and little by little by little it's not the first day you get in contact with those things of the world that they totally pull you away little by little by little by little uh, they begin to have influence on you 
and later the influence of the world and the influence of the world they are at par eventually the influence of the world and the thing that is attracting you in the world they become higher than the interest you have in the word of God and now again the things you have led before the things you have abandoned before and the things you have uh, consecrated to the Lord before I will not touch that I will not go that way I will not allow that to take my interest those things now they seize your heart again and it seize your life again and you're again entangled therein and you are overcome and it says the latter end is worse than the beginning that's why we need to watch in our lives that all these things that the lord jesus christ is talking about and he says if you lay your hand on the plow and then you look back to them you turn back to them that you're unfit now for the kingdom of god and the latter end of the man or the woman is worse than the beginning let's look at number two here number two here is the damnation for turning back seeking satisfaction first satisfaction first when you now begin to think about yourself about your body about your taste about your likings about your convenience and your comfort above your calling in the things of the kingdom of God a little challenge no foil a little challenge no money the new currency for me to be able to even get to at the meeting place and a little difficulty you know things on the way and I don't think I can make it now when you begin to think like that and you're seeking now self-satisfaction and you're seeking the ease of the world a little headache and then you cannot come to the meeting and yet that same little headache you still take that headache to the place of work and to the market and to the grocery uh, you understand your principles and your priorities are now changing there is damnation in seeking self-satisfaction before the service of the lord in psalm 78 i'm reading from verse 8 psalm 78 verse 8 and might not be as the their fathers, a stubborn and a rebellious generation, a generation that said not their heart aright, and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. In verse 9, in verse 9 it says, the children of Ephraim being armed and carrying bows turned back in the day of battle here we are we're training for evangelism we're training for the service of the lord and then when that evangelism when that gck comes and when that service comes with all the training we're not there what are we inviting the people getting the people, making them to come, prevailing on them to come, having all those locations outside our little circle in the sanctuary, in the local church, and bringing them, bringing them as if the crusade were to be held in your place here. But the interest is not showing, and the passion is not showing, and the, the self-denial is not showing. We just turn back with all the training we've got, and with all the energy we have got, we turn back in the day of battle. That's not good enough. I pray that God will set us on fire for his work all over again in Jesus' name. Headquarters, amen. Look at number three there. Number three here is our destiny for always, 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 always putting his service first. Always, always, any day. It's really the service of God first. The sun that heat is so much. The service of God first. That my child is not the way I want her, I want him to be. And this pays my heart all the same. The child issue is there. 
the service of God first. All the things taking place in a place of work, at this uh, crunchy time, they even retrenching people. I hope, I hope it doesn't get to me, whatever. The service of God first. The service of God first. And that is what God is looking for. That always, at all times, God will be forced, Christ will be forced, a service of soul winning will be forced in our lives. In Matthew chapter 6, and I'm reading from verse 33, but seek ye first all the time, but seek ye first in your conversation, in your interaction, in your prayers, in your pursuit, in everything you do, but seek ye first the kingdom of God, the expansion of that kingdom, the promotion of that kingdom, the deepening of that kingdom, the bringing of that kingdom into the hands of men and women around you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. His righteousness in you. And right, it's righteousness in your neighbors. It's, it's righteousness in your converts. It's righteousness in the church. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Amen. Amen. The Lord give us the heart, the mind, the spirit, the passion, the consecration. To put him first at all times. In everything. Always in our lives. And then we remain dependable people. Trustworthy people. Following the Lord. Following the Lord to service. And following the Lord to heaven. Amen. amen. A great amen. Amen. Let's rise up and present ourselves before the Lord in prayer that God will fulfill this in our heart and that by our following God unreservedly we make the heart of Christ, the heart of our Father in heaven and the heart of the Holy Spirit and the heart of heaven happy and joyful that God has found a set of people that follow him or is Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer.